Hi, I'm Tom Laskowski. I run Midwest Native Skills. We're here in Northeast Ohio, just south of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, for those new joining us, I want to welcome you. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, we run an outdoor wilderness survival school that we branched out into uh, self-reliance at home and uh, living up to our motto, rediscovering the old ways. And by that we mean there's a lot of uh, uh, things that our grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents did that are being lost. And so we're uh, trying to keep them alive by sharing them with you and uh, reteaching them. So we offer a wide range of classes. Naturally, our uh, bread and butter is wilderness survival, taking you out in the woods and teaching you how to, how to live with basically nothing, living by your wits and what nature provides. Uh, uh, we have four levels of those survival classes, starting out with a very nice, easy uh, uh, format where you're camping out. We even uh, cook meals for you and teach you how to do all that, we're teaching you the basics. So think of that as a camping trip where you're learning things and having fun doing it. And then our second level, you're actually uh, living in a shelter you built. Uh, you're learning how to field dress animals. You're putting what you learned in the first class actually to work. And so you're, you're making those skills your own by actually doing them and, and performing them in real life situations. Our third class is a nomadic trip. We'll go to the Smoky Mountains or someplace and go from point A to point B to point C and live off the land and uh, live in a variety of situations and deal with whatever comes up. And our fourth class is our knife and blanket only. You're out there with a knife and a blanket uh, in a safe situation. Uh, and uh, the instructors are around you as much or as little uh, help or instruction as you want, but we're there as a safety net just in case. Uh, we always want to say we love our military, but we teach, uh, we don't teach the way the military teaches survival, and they typically teach with equipment. We teach without equipment, more like the Native Americans and the pioneers used. So, uh, with that said, uh, just uh, uh, real briefly, uh, uh, today's topic, I'm sure that's why you're here, is on moonshine, moonshine making, and uh, the uses for moonshine other than drinking. Uh, I want to start this out. Very, uh, the very first thing is saying that making uh, liquor, making moonshine, is illegal. It is illegal to distill unless you have a license to do it. Now, to make actual moonshine or liquor to drink, it's a long process to get a distiller's license. However, you can get a license to make alcohol as a fuel. And by that I mean for your lawnmower, for your car. Uh, I'm sure at the gas pump you've seen ethanol added to the fuel. And uh, you can add about up to 10%. It actually helps the octane. Not the greatest for the uh, gaskets in uh, certain engines, but uh, it does kick up the octane a bit and extends the fuel a little bit. So just to uh, save any ATF agents out there watching this, a trip over to our house and knocking on our door, I'd just like to show you I did get my fuel alcohol permit. Uh, there you can see. Uh, you apply to the government. Uh, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, but you do have to give them a layout of your property and uh, you have to report how much alcohol you made and things like that. So, but everything you make can only be used for fuel for vehicles. So that's what we um, adhere to. We want to stay within the law. However, uh, just we do post these posters around our property just in case we find any bootleg stills. Believe me, we will report them to our uh, good friends over at ATF. So we're trying to help you guys out too. Okay, let's get on to our topic now. Uh, 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 moonshine. Uh, I just had a class in moonshine making. Uh, it was a Saturday. It was a half-day class. And I just put one up on the website. It's going to be uh, uh, on a Saturday, September 19th. It's going to be a Saturday morning from 9 to noon. Half-day class. Uh, this one we're going to do it a little different. You can come here to uh, to our uh, school in Northeast Ohio if you live close by or we're going to try this one virtual so you can uh, take the class in the comfort of your own home and that's going to be great for you people that are out of town if uh, you're living out in Texas I know 
there's a few people out there. Uh, Michael might be out there, and he might want to learn moonshining, but he's not going to make a trip to back to Cleveland. So uh, we're going to do a virtual trip, uh, a virtual class. So you can do that uh, if you would like. Uh, it's on the website. Uh, but that'll be September 19th, and September 12th we have our plant class and all. But let's get down to, to moonshine. Uh, the class we had was Tennessee moonshine making, and uh, uh, I won't go into details, but I learned this process from a gentleman uh, who actually illegally made whiskey back in the 50s and 60s, and he had uh, uh, two of these, only they were 200 gallons still. This is a 20 gallon still. And uh, taught me basically uh, all the basics, and I'm going to share a lot of those with you on the basics of, of making uh, uh, liquor. Um, it's uh, the process is basically very easy. Uh, if, you have, if you're a winemaker out there, you have half the process done already. What you do is you take uh, water, add sugar to it, and you add yeast. Now, uh, if you're making wine and you're going to be drinking it, you don't want to use bread yeast. So when they were actually making liquor to drink or moonshine to drink, they wouldn't use bread yeast. They would use a wine yeast or a champagne yeast. Uh, but since we're making this for fuel only, uh, you could use any kind of yeast you wanted. Uh, so you add the sugar, the uh, water, and the yeast together. When they combine, if the temperature is around 70 degrees, what's going to happen is the yeast is going to eat the sugar and there will be two byproducts. The bri uh, one of the byproducts is carbon dioxide, so that's why with wine making you'll see it bubbling. The other product, byproduct, is alcohol, so that's where you get your alcohol. Uh, when uh, all the uh, yeast consumes the sugar, the uh, process is considered done if you're a winemaker that's when you would go to the second process of racking or siphoning off your wine, letting all the sediment drop. And when all the sediment drops, it's clear you would drink your wine. Well, the moonshiner does his, instead of a small batch, he'll do it in a barrel like this. This is a 60-gallon barrel. And uh, let's see, right now, let me show you a bit. I know you can't see inside here, but here's some grain. And it smells a bit sour, that's why they call this sour mash. And that's working right now, meaning the yeast is actually consuming the, the sugar and it's converting that sugar into alcohol. So, uh, what, uh, there's two things you really have to buy if, if you're actually thinking about doing this. Uh, you have to buy two hydrometers. Hydrometer is a cylinder, and it's uh, like the old battery testers if you're over uh, 40 years old. You remember how they used to test the old uh, uh, lead-acid batteries in cars? But the hydrometer, you drop it in this cylinder fill filled with liquid, and it floats at a certain level. Well, they have a sugar hydrometer and an alcohol hydrometer. At this point, you use the sugar hydrometer. You take the liquid, and you put that little floaty thing in there. And it floats at the level telling you what percentage of sugar is in there. So you know how much sugar you put in. Now, um, it's kind of, it makes it easy because the percentage of sugar you start out with, assuming the yeast eats it all, is the percentage of alcohol you end up with. So if I start this barrel out with 5% sugar and the yeast eats all the sh sugar, converts it all to alcohol and the carbon dioxide goes up in the air, that barrel will be full of 5% alcohol. Now if I put more sugar in, it'll be 10% sugar, I'll have 10% alcohol. And that's great, I can go up to 15% sugar, I'll have 15% alcohol. Problem is, yeast tend to die at higher percentages of alcohol. Uh, wine yeast, you probably can't push more than about 15%. And there's ways to even push it maybe to 20%, but not much higher. So uh, you have to, you can't just go unlimited. I can't put 50% sugar in there and get 50% alcohol. That doesn't work. But 15% very doable. 16% very doable. So uh, you want to start with. Let's say we're going to start with 15% sugar. Uh, put your yeast in. Let it work. Usually about two, three weeks. 
it'll convert all of that sugar into alcohol. Now you have a liquid, it stops bubbling, it stops doing its thing. Then what we do is we uh, siphon off the liquid. Now, a lot, some of the old time moonshiners would just dump it into the still here and then start heating it. I have my propane tank here with fire under there and you heat it up. But then you get all the corn and the, and the grains in there and then it burns to the bottom. So a better way to do that is just take the liquid off. Put the liquid in here. Now that liquid is called the wash. So you put the wash in here, turn up the heat, and this is where a little bit of finesse comes in. Uh, alcohol boils at 173 degrees. Now you already know that water boils at 212 degrees. So alcohol boils here, water boils here. So if we heat this up to just 173 degrees or keep it right around there, our alcohol will boil off while keeping most of the water not boiling because it needs to be at 212 degrees. So if we keep this at a, right around 173 degrees by adjusting our propane tank and the flame under it, that steam is going to be mostly alcohol. The steam is going to come up here, go through this tube here, and on stills you've probably seen in pictures they have that long coil. They call that the worm. All that coil did is it was long enough and they sometimes immersed it in water. It condensed that steam back to a liquid, liquid alcohol at that point, and it came out the end into a jug. Well, you can use a worm, but most of you know I'm an engineer, so let's bring it a little more into the 20, 21st century. This is just simply a water jacket. So I'll take a hose, put cold water in the bottom of it, fills this tube with cold water, and this tube runs all the way down the center, so that'll cool off my tube inside. It'll cool off the steam coming through, and instead of having 20, 25 feet of that coil, I can do it all in about a five-foot section here. Save a little bit of space and a whole lot of copper, and we know copper is expensive. And then the alcohol will come out the other end. So this is an old-fashioned 20-gallon moonshine still. Um, pretty simple. Uh, what comes out the first time through is going to be, uh, I should explain proof a little bit. Proof is a way to uh, determine how much alcohol and how much water is, is in your final product. A um, hundred proof means it's half water, half alcohol. 50% water, 50% alcohol. Uh, if it's 80 proof, that means it's 40% alcohol, 60% water. If it's 120 proof, well, it's just the opposite. It's 60% alcohol, 40% water. So that's how they, uh, they determine. The reason they call it proof is at 100 proof, that's the lowest amount of alcohol, the 50-50 point, where if you put a match to it, it'll actually burn. It'll burn with somewhat, it'll be a blue flame, but there'll be some orange and yellow in there. So if, uh, and that's what most, back in the old days, the moonshiners would sell their whiskey to people at about 100 proof. And so if you come to a moonshiner and you're about a big bottle of whiskey, and he says, okay, here's 100 proof whiskey, first question you're going to ask him is, prove it to me. So I'm going to pay you, you know, $20, $30 for that gallon, prove that it's 100 proof. And most people didn't have hydrometers back then to check it, because that's what your alcohol hydrometer does. You pour it in, put that little float in, and it would float right at the 100 mark to show you this is 100 proof. Well, they didn't have that, or, you know, they were in the backwoods, they didn't have it. So what they did, they pour a little, actually what they did, they had a little gunpowder from their shotgun, because they had the shotgun, because they were looking for those revenors or ATF agents. Uh, so they pour a little gunpowder down, put a little of their liquor on there, and then lit it with a match. And uh, if it went up and exploded a little bit for theatrics, I just proved to you that that was 100 proof because it burned. So that was their proof. Uh, the gunpowder was, like I said, for theatrics. You could just pour some down and put a match to it. And if it burns, it's 100 proof. 
Now, if it burns with just a blue flame, it's probably 120 or 130 proof or even higher. Uh, there's also ways to test proof if you put it in a mason jar, which is very typical. You could shake it and look at the bead or the bubbles coming off and the size of the bead and how fast they go away. Uh, you can also, if you have a good eye and have been doing this most of your life, you can estimate what the proof is. But uh, that's where the word proof came from. But anyway, if you run your still, first time through, you'll get about 140 proof out of your first run if you maintain this temperature pretty close to 173. You're still getting water. You're not going to get high proof, you know, pure alcohol out of it. About 140. So that's still pretty good. It's 70% alcohol. Not bad. If you want higher, you take that 140 proof, wait till you get about 20 gallons of it, fill this still with 140 proof liquor, make another run. That's your second run. And what you get out the end, it's going to redistill it, about 160 proof. You get the diminishing returns, but that's pretty good. You just increased it. Want higher? You run it through again. You get about 170 proof out of it. Run it through again. About 175 out of it. Run it through again. Probably 180. And so each time you get your gains are less and less, but you can increase the proof of your liquor by continually doing second, third, and even fourth runs. Now this is taking your time, so the higher proof liquor is going to cost more because it's costing the man. Now this is if you're buying it, which again, I want to repeat, it's illegal. But that's what they did when they were making moonshine. Now again, when you're making it for running in your car, running it uh, for other methods, and I'm going to go over those in a second, you still want high proof because you don't want to be putting water in your car engine. So you're going to have to do several runs as if you were the moonshiner trying to sell the high proof liquor. So you want to do several runs. And uh, if you ever looked on a moonshine bottle, you saw the X's on it. All those X's were was how many times that jug of moonshine was redistilled. Three X's means he ran it through three times. Two X's, he ran it through twice. Four X's, pretty high proof, he ran it through four times. So, little trivia there. So, uh, oh, by the way, uh, you probably wonder, well, how can you tell how much, if I ever want to get my alcohol permit, which you have to if you're going to do this, uh, how much sugar should I put in? So uh, I did some calculations. We're going to put that up on the uh, Facebook page. Um, what you're going to uh, need. So roughly, it's one pound of sugar in one gallon of water will yield about a 6% sugar solution. So don't remember about remembering this. It's going to be up on the, on my, on the Facebook page. Uh, so that's 6%. And again, remember, the good thing about this is if you have a 6% sugar solution, you can think of that as 6% sugar or alcohol potential. If all the sugar gets converted to alcohol by the yeast, you're going to have 6% alcohol in that gallon. Uh, if you add 2 pounds of sugar to a gallon, you get 12% sugar solution. And if it converts, you're going to have 12% alcohol in that gallon. And same thing, and I did this all the way up. If you want to do, uh, I said this is a 60 pound. So if you wanted to do this, say this was 50 pounds. If you wanted a 6% solution, you need 50 pounds of sugar. Well, we'd want to go higher than that. I'd want closer to an 18% sugar solution because that would give me, if all that would turn to alcohol, that means I'd have 18% alcohol in there. When I run it through here, I'd get a lot of yield out that back end. I'd need 150 pounds of sugar to put in that barrel to get an 18% sugar solution. 150 pounds of sugar. Now just think about that. So people wonder, why is alcohol so fattening? Well, I just told you that the process is the yeast eats the sugar, converts it to carbon dioxide and alcohol. Well, now if you go to the bar and you buy that alcohol and consume it, you know what your body does? It takes that alcohol and converts it back to sugar. So that Jack Daniels you just chugged down, it's like taking probably a cup of sugar, white sugar, and just pouring it down your throat. So that's one, one reason why alcohol is so fattening. Pure carbohydrates. 
So we'll put this up so you can um, uh, look at that. So, okay, since we're not drinking it, what else can you do with this uh, alcohol? Well, one thing, we're in the middle of COVID, and uh, you can't buy uh, isopropyl alcohol to save your soul now. I haven't seen it in the stores in, since March. So if you make your own alcohol, you can make your own hand sanitizer. Very simple solution, or a very simple um, uh, process. You take, uh, if you want to say make a cup of it, and you can scale up however you want. Two thirds of a cup of alcohol, and one third of a cup of aloe vera uh, gel. You want the aloe vera, now you could use straight alcohol, and that's gonna kill that COVID real quick. Only you use that for a day or two, your hands are gonna get very, very dry. So you want the aloe vera to, to moisturize your hands a little bit so your hands won't get dry and cracked and all that. And that's all it is. So by putting two thirds of a cup of alcohol and a third of a cup of aloe vera, you'll get a hand sanitizer. Now, before you say, that's all I gotta do, listen to this part. That's gonna give you, once you mix the two, you have to use at least 90% alcohol. That's 180 proof alcohol. If you use anything under that, it's not gonna work. Reason is, by mixing the alcohol with the aloe vera, you're diluting the alcohol. So by that formula I gave you, two thirds of a cup of alcohol and a third of a cup of aloe vera, your end product is gonna be about 60% alcohol. About 120 proof. That's enough to kill COVID. You go below that, and it's getting iffy. You go much below that, and it's not working very well. So that's why you need to start with 180 proof alcohol, mix it with the aloe vera. Now, if you want it to smell good, add some essential oils, which brings me to a point. Uh, two Thursdays from now, we're gonna be talking about essential oils for health and well-being. So I'm gonna mention it at the end again, but just keep that in mind. Uh, we're gonna be talking essential oils, uh, whatever the date is for two Thursdays from now. But you can add the essential oils to this hand sanitizer. So again, remember, if, you're, if we're gonna be making hand sanitizer, we get as high of a proof as we can in the mash, we get probably 18%, let all the yeast eat it, siphon the liquid off, now it's called wash, put it in the still, keep the still at about 173 degrees, let it go through its thing, put water through the heat exchanger so it condenses, we'll get 140 proof out, not good enough, save up enough of that, pour it back in here, run it again, we'll get 160 out, Save that up, run it through again, get 170 out, run it through again. If we really watch the temperature, maybe in three runs we can get 180 out, definitely within four runs. So we'll have our 180 proof we can make our hand sanitizer. And now at that point, 180 proof, that's good enough to run in your lawn mower, in your weed whackers, in your car. If you're putting it into a, an engine, you don't want to put more than 10% in. Uh, that's what you're getting in uh, at the gas stations. So you don't want to go much more than that. And you don't want to add it if you already have 10% ethanol in the gas that you're buying already. Because then that would be 20% and that's a little much. So uh, uh, you don't want to exceed 10% total that you're putting into your vehicles. Whereas the carburetors and things aren't really designed for more than 10%. Another thing we can do for uh, uh, with this alcohol is uh, for camping. Well, I told you I'm into survival. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, if you don't want to make a campfire, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with alcohol stoves. You, there's plenty of YouTube videos on there, how you can make them out of Coke cans and all kind of designs. And this is one that we carry in our school store. Um, it's very durable, made of titanium, super light, called a Decagon. Uh, has its own pot stand made here, very stable, sets on almost anything, and uh, it works off alcohol. 
The alcohol, I'll get closer so you can see this deck of gotten a little better. Good pots. The, these little raised things here will keep a pot above the flame. Put your alcohol here in the middle. And this wide thing is just so it sets flat on almost anything so your pot won't fall over. They recommend gas line antifreeze. This heat in a yellow bottle. Get it Walmart, any auto parts store. Uh, again, you just pour it in here, light this, put your stove on there, it's a, it's a heat source. Now you can't adjust the flame with these alcohol stoves, but they'll boil your water if you have mountain house or freeze dried food, you're making rice, whatever, it's a way to heat water, it's a way to purify water. So if you can't, I mean, you know, if the auto parts stores are out of this, don't have it, you're not buying an auto parts store, if you're at home, everything's closed. Who knows the situation? You can always make your own alcohol. True, you need your own sugar. And uh, in our moonshine class, we'll, okay, if you can't buy sugar, how can you get sugar out of grains? We'll go into sprouting and all that, but that's more for the moonshine class, not for this class on, on what to do. So this is an old time uh, still uh, that the moonshiners would use. Now, we're going to take the camera and go over there. I'll show you more of a modern still. We're going to move the camera, so if you get seasick very easily, you might want to close your eyes, because there'll be some bouncing and weaving and stuff as we move about 20 feet. But uh, we need to go. i got to show you a more modern still that uh, you can buy t today uh, online. So uh, let's take a little seat trip. By the way, I haven't seen any questions. I'm sure you have some questions out there. And uh, you know me, I love questions. Pot me... still. Who? Ot. Ot? Uh, you like that? I like that one too. Uh, and there are benefits to going with a copper still ot uh, versus stainless steel. But uh, like I said, we'll leave that for the moonshine making class. Uh, this is a stainless steel one. This is a five gallon still. That was a 20. Uh, a couple nice things about this. Um, uh, by the way, these things aren't cheap. This still set up was probably about eh, a little under a thousand dollars, but good stainless steel, extremely high quality stainless steel, nice ways to clamp things down and all that. Last you a lifetime, but you can and there's options you can get just like buying a car. Uh, this is called a pot still, P-O-T, pot still. Uh, the traditional reason for these kind was for making actually alcohol to drink because if you put grains in here. This would actually transfer some of the flavors into your end product. There's another type of still called a column still or a reflux still. Same thing, different name. Uh, it would still have this pot here, only rather than this over here, it would go straight up really tall. And uh, that would be basically that column strips out all the flavors and you're going to get just pure alcohol with basically no taste. So if you uh, had your distiller's license and were interested in making like a vodka with no taste, that would be the still for you. If you were, had your distiller's license and were interested in making a whiskey or a bourbon, this would be the still for you. Yes? I have a question. Good. Derek would like to know what grains you use. Ah, the, the uh, uh, recipes. There's, there's a lot of recipes online, Derek. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, when he took me aside and told me everything that I needed to know to make moonshine, the last thing he said, <laughs> I remember this as if it were yesterday, he was about 86 when he did this, and uh, told me all, everything about keeping everything clean, and he said, now I'm going to tell you my recipe. And he looked at me, he looked through me, like I said, he was from Tennessee, he was 86, and even at 86, he was like, man, you just wouldn't want to mess with him. He said, this is between you and me. Even my boy don't know this. And he told me his recipe. So my recipe for if, let's say, if I would make whiskey to drink, I, wouldn't, I couldn't share it with you. But I will tell you the grains are typically corn. You'd use probably in a 20-gallon still, you'd use about... A total of grains of about 40 pounds. 
the grains would be uh, 25 pounds roughly of corn and the other 15 pounds you use a combination and that'd be up to you because by adjusting the other corns you're going to get different flavors it's going to be wheat barley and rye uh, you could use them just whole or you could use them malted by malted I mean uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt process but what you do is you spread them out over a large area here's malted corn in here Cheryl could you put this close to the screen so you can see what this is flaked malted that's corn that's flaked and malted there you go it's almost like coarser than cornmeal but not much it's coarser than cornmeal but you take the grain now in that case they took the corn spread it out wetted it down and in about three days the corn actually sprouts like it's trying to grow a, grow a corn stalk then you dry it by the corn sprouting it turns the starch in the corn to sugar then you take that corn and grind it so the, the process of it sprouting is called malting m-a-l-t-i-n-g so now I have more sugar so I don't have to buy that 200 pounds of sugar I can probably buy less sugar because the grain which is giving me flavor is now also giving me sugar but to answer your question those are the grains typically are used how you mix them what percentage is going to give you your different flavors if you want to use some malted already and any wine store you can buy grains that are pre-malted you don't have to go through the process they cost about double uh, give you like how much uh, a pound of malted rye is two dollars a pound a pound of malted barley is two dollars a pound unmalted grain is about a dollar a pound uh, just to give you some ideas so you can have a lot of money tied up into grain uh, back in the day my car doesn't care what flavor it is true your car doesn't care what flavor it is so we're talking hypothetically if you were drinking this uh, since we're making this for our car we're just going to use straight sugar thank you for keeping me on track I was talking hypothetical uh, in our moonshine class we also go into hypothetically where you can store this for your car you can store it into just barrels you know into anything or you can store it in charred barrels there's no law against where you store your alcohol for your car if you store it in charred barrels it gives it flavor and your car might like flavors but that's for the moonshine class another question? question i do adam would like to know uh where you get these pot stills from pot stills uh adam i'm this close to becoming a dealer for this type of still uh in fact i have to call tomorrow to see uh, if I can make some final deals so uh, I'll be putting it on my Facebook page if not uh, and I'm going to be trying to give you guys the very best price especially if you're signed up to my you know, like me and sign up for my newsletters I'm going to try to cut you the best deal I can because like I said they are expensive you can not just go online put in moonshine stills for sale and uh, mount Mile High Distillers sells them. Uh, that's one that comes to mind. Claw Hammer is another one that comes to mind. Uh, if you are seriously buying a still, and like I said, I feel like a salesman, like I want you to take this moonshine class, but maybe you want to take the moonshine class so you know, gee, do I want copper? Do I want stainless steel? Do I want a reflux? How many plates do I want in the reflux? Do I want a pot still? Because uh, we want to make sure your car's happy with the alcohol you're going to make. Uh, so uh, you can just look it up on the internet. Any more? Okay. Uh, pot still reflux, again, just like my still there. Put your stuff in here. They gave you a thermometer on the side, which is really nice. It, go, it would go right into the wash and could keep that temperature right there. Uh, you can fire them up with electric or, or fuel. I'm gonna try this with an induction uh, heating element. So I'm gonna go really 21st century. 
The induction heating elements are nice because you could set the temperature at 173 degrees and it'll hold it there. Never try that. And like I said, that's one thing I love about running a school. I get to try all this stuff and I'm always learning. So not sure how good it's going to work, but uh, like I said, I'll, I'll let you know in my posts. Uh, how that induction works. Again, we're adding a little bit of money to this. You have to buy an induction heating element rather than just a propane tank. Uh, but if it makes a better product, a lot easier. While we're talking about propane tanks, probably most of you know this, but in case you don't, I know a lot of you like just to go to your Walmart or Menards or wherever to get your cylinders exchanged. I believe the law says they can't give you more than 13 pounds of propane in those cylinders. If you go to a hardware store or a uh, uh, tractor supply and take an empty cylinder in and they have their tank there and they fill it, they will give you a full 20 pounds. And it costs about $1.10, $1.20 a pound, where uh, if you have that exchange, they're still going to cost you 20 25 dollars for 13 pounds so uh, I always get my propane tanks filled at a hardware store and uh, you get 20 pounds for around 20 bucks or if I go to some place and for the exchange I get 13 pounds for 25 bucks so just to save you a few dollars okay back on track what time is it I don't want to keep these people too long 25 up, 25 up. we got time keep the questions coming I love your questions um, we're getting fancy now. This is We're going to the advanced class. Uh, this is called a thumper keg. If you ever hear what a thumper keg is, normally, and my still there, this comes out right into the heat exchanger. We don't even have this. Again, heat. This is, this is where the worm would be, but we do a heat exchanger. Water in at the bottom, water out, cools it down, alcohol comes out here. This is your still. We want to get fancy. If your car wants to have good tasting fuel, we add a thumper keg. Or if we want to kind of distill it twice quickly. Now this would naturally have to be higher up. So this would mate to this. Ugh. These are heavy. But this, if you ever read about a thumper keg, that's what this is. What you would do with this is you would put water in the bottom just a little bit and uh or back in the days if they wanted to flavor the moonshine if they were illegally selling it or drinking it which we're not going to do uh you would put fruit juice in there you would put water with cinnamon sticks you could put you name it put it in and what happens the steam would come here come here let me open this up I'll show you what these tubes go into. This is just an open pot here. So it would go down here into the bottom of this thumper keg. It makes a thumping noise like a bump, bump, bump as it bubbles through and actually heats up that liquid to 173 degrees so in essence this thumper keg is doing two things it's adding flavor steam and it's actually kind of redistilling it twice so it's kind of like running it through twice that steam comes up comes up to the top here out here again this is here like this now I put my worm on or my heat exchanger and it condenses it and the alcohol comes out here. So in essence, redistilled it again and added whatever flavor came out of there. If you don't want flavor, you would just put a little bit of water down here. It's going to kind of redistill it twice. So probably twice through here, it would come out about 155 proof with just one distillation. Run it through again, I might get close to 170, maybe 175 on two distillations. On three distillations, maybe 185. If I really watch the temperature close, and since I have the thermometer there, I can do that. Maybe with that induction heater, maybe I can get 180 proof or even higher on just two runs. So there's benefits to it. So uh, by going a little more high tech, there, there definitely are benefits. Uh, again, 
for my alcohol stove, I want high proof. I don't want to be burning water because it'll be fizzling and stuff. So I want it as close to a pure alcohol. Again, you can't get 200 proof out of a bill like this. To get anything above, I guess the exact number is 192 uh, proof, which is, you know, 90 some percent alcohol. You need a chem lab. You need to put it under pressure to get that 200 proof or, or you know, 195, 198 or 200 proof. Uh, so you need to put it under pressure and to, to achieve that. But the average person here, you can get 180, 185. I've got 185 before. You can probably push it to 187 if you want to keep redistilling it. But again, each time through, you'll get a couple more proof out of it. But it just at a point, just doesn't pay for your time to keep doing it to get another two points out of it, another point out of it. Uh, and for hand sanitizer, I'd stop at 180. That'd be fine. For your car, higher's better. 190 would be great. I'd stop at 180. I know uh, when I first started, I was putting it in my drag race car, and uh, I put a gallon of 180 proof in. Now, true, there was out, there was water in there. I mixed it with uh, the 20 gallons of gasoline, and uh, actually, uh, I have friends there to back me up on it. The car turned one of its fastest times when I put that gallon of uh, moonshine in it. So, uh, it could have been coincidence, could have been, uh, I don't know, but it went pretty quick. So, any other questions? Nobody else has any moonshine questions out there? I have two questions. Oh, okay. So, Derek would like to know where you got the old still from. Friend of a friend. Uh, made that for me, and that was back in 1983, and I have no idea. Uh, one thing I will tell you, that if you are going to have a still made, always, it always has to be put together with silver solder, not lead solder. You all, everybody heard stories about people going blind, and they're blaming it on high-proof moonshine. Uh, I guess it might be possible if you drink enough high-proof moonshine to go blind, but you would pass out long before that happens, in my opinion. Uh, having lead poisoning will cause you to go blind, though. Uh, back in the hills, or back in Prohibition days, uh, I mean, they had coils. I, they, I'm not even, I never even saw a heat exchanger like this back on any still in Prohibition days. They always used the uh, worms, the uh, coils. Now, copper was relatively cheap then, but uh, they'd have to buy the copper. And they said, hell, I got an old car here with a radiator in it. Why not? Let's use that radiator. That's, that would be a good, and it worked. You can use a radiator to, uh, especially if you're using uh, your alcohol just for fuel. However, back then they were using it to sell as a beverage, drinking it. And radiators are put together with lead solder. So as they were cooling down, the alcohol coming out, it was picking up lead. So they were poisoning whoever was buying it with some degree of lead. And that's what was causing people to go blind. So you want to use only lead, uh, uh, only silver solder to put those together. Also, you can buy stills online uh, that are copper. Uh, if you are ever thinking about getting a still, if I, for some reason, don't become a dealer or you can find better prices than I'll have, uh, you want a heavier gauge uh, copper. It's going to cost you more money, I know. But remember, you're putting uh, the, the weight of the wash is going to be eight and a half, figure nine pounds a gallon. So if you buy a 20 gallon still, you're going to have close to 200 pounds of liquid in there. Uh, a heavier gauge isn't going to ding as much on the sides. Um, you're making an investment. It's going to be expensive anyway. The little more cost for a little higher gauge. Just bite the bullet. Uh, after you pay for it, in two months you won't remember how much more you paid for it. It'll be better. Like I said, this little pot still is heavy. And it's a real good gauge steel. It's going to, you know... If I had kids, I'd probably will it to them because it's going to last a long time. Uh, I, but honestly, I don't know who made that. It was a friend of mine, uh, old-timer, and he made it. 
I'm sure he's long, long gone. Brenton wants to know what type of mash base you'd use to make an alcohol for a tincture. I would use... Okay. Brenton, all you want is the alcohol. I would use the straight sugar. Because the only reasons you're using grain is for flavor. I mean, you know, I've been talking to guys and they like this kind of whiskey or that kind of whiskey to drink. You know, we're talking drinking because they like the flavor. They like the flavor. Uh, that's the only reason you're using the grains. You're getting a little bit of sugar. Like I said, if you malt it, it's not cost effective at all. So the sugar is much cheaper. Uh, I believe Wendy's put up or putting up that chart on how much uh, sugar to get what percentage of alcohol. I would just use straight uh, straight sugar. Use Don't use tap water. You want to use some kind of filtered water. You don't want chlorine in it because chlorine is going to inhibit the growth of yeast. <laughs> and that's what you want the yeast to do. So either put a filter on it or if you have filtered water at home or do what Jack Daniels did, find a, find a good running spring from... Uh, but yeah, I would just, for tinctures, just use uh, just use sugar. And I know, Brenton, you know this answer, but there's some out there that might not. Uh, when you're making tinctures, you do not want high proof alcohol for your tinctures. You want 100 proof. And your tinctures, you want it half water, half alcohol. Because you want whatever uh, plant material you're putting in, you want the water-soluble components to dissolve in the water and the alcohol soluble to dissolve in the alcohol so say we get 180 proof out of this still and I'm going to use it for a tincture and I'm going to say this is great it's high proof yeah I'm putting in, it's 90 percent alcohol so the alcohol soluble parts of the plant are going to dissolve great but we're really starving the water soluble because there's only 10 percent water in that tincture solution so you want dead nuts on 100 proof and most people just go with a good vodka 100 proof vodka it's easy no taste uh, but if you want to make your own and uh, uh, I'm making my own because again uh, if you're using essential oils and of that mindset you're probably into energy work and things so their mindset the day they made it. Were they ticked off at their boss? Were they mad that their football team lost or whatever? Uh, or were they in a real good mindset? So Some people believe that energy could transfer into the alcohol, which would transfer into the tincture, which would transfer to the end. Yes? Okay, so I have a follow-up question from Brett, and he wants to know, does it matter how much mash I make at a time, and how long will Run Run take? Okay. Uh, mash will last a while. By that I mean a month. Uh, it doesn't really go bad, but once you make it, you probably want to run it and get the alcohol out of it within a month. Uh, the thing was, how long will it take? Uh, I can give you estimates on my 20 gallon. Uh, once I have that mash running, it'll take a minute of 14 days usually i'll give it three weeks to work until it converts all that sugar into alcohol at that point i'll use a submersible pump hang on did you ask the question Harbor Freight, I forgot what it cost, 30 bucks. Works off 12 volts, put a 12 volt battery in there, put the pump in with the hose, put this down the mash barrel, put the other end of the hose into the still, which was right next to it, pump the wash into the still, fire the still up. The still will run, to get it up to temperature it takes about two hours, 
Uh, it'll take, if I maintain that temperature at 170 degrees, it'll take another four hours, four to five hours to have the run complete. Now I only have 20 gallons, so that's a 60 gallon barrel, I gotta do that three times. So then I have all the alcohol out of there and uh, you can calculate how much yield I'm gonna get out because, okay, let's say I have 15% alcohol in that barrel, 60 gallons. Okay, uh, 60 gallons at 15%, so 30 gallons would be 30% alcohol, 15 gallons would be 60% alcohol, 7.5 gallons would be 120 gallons of alcohol, 20, 120 proof alcohol, so if I got 100% transfer, I said I, my first run I'll get about 140 proof. I'll probably get, if everything was 100%, about six, six and a half gallons out of it. You're never gonna get 100%. I usually cut the still off. Just putting out about 80 proof because it goes down real fast after that. And if I were drinking it or selling it to drink, which I don't because that's illegal, uh, you start getting a corn taste to it, and you don't want that. Uh, but for the car, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I figure on five gallons of 140 proof out of that. And then you redistill that. So out of that uh, total, you might get, and each time you're going to lose some, they say that losing that, you lose some to the angels. Uh, out of that 60 gallons, I might get a good three to four gallons of 170 proof liquor out of it, plus or minus. I heard another question. No, it was just, again, he asked, does it matter how much mash I make at a time? No. And he wanted to know how long the run was. No, does not make, I mean, uh, Mr. Wilson was making, uh, well, he had two, two, two 200 gallon stills, that's 400 gallons, so no. I mean, you know, I, I guess ideally I should just have a 20-gallon um, mash going because that's what my still is. But actually back there I have 120 gallons going, so I, that, I'm going to have to make six runs out of my still. Um, so that'll take me a couple weekends, a couple evenings, whatever. Uh, but no, you can make as much mash as you want. But again, 60 gallons... Uh, 60 gallons is going to cost, you're going to have to put in 150 pounds, 175 pounds of sugar. That's going to cost you about 100, Sam's Club price is about 120 bucks. Just for the sugar. And if you're adding any grains, that's going to cost you another 50 bucks. And then if you're going for a little higher proof, you probably should add as in a winemaking class some yeast nutrients and stuff like that. That'll be another 20 bucks. So you probably have 170 bucks tied up in that mash barrel. And like I said, to get, in the end, four gallons of 180 proof liquor. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, this was just an overview. We're going to have the moonshine making class. You can take it by coming here directly and get hands on a thumper keg or a pot still. Or you can take it virtually at the comfort of your home. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it and see you in two weeks.